471C, E381B, okay? And this is lecture number 23. And uh, you can read this fine. You sure? Okay. And again, uh, my name is uh, Takao Inoue with uh, National Instruments here in town. And I'll be filling in for Professor He today. So uh, let's get on with the topics. Uh, continuing on, um, so the course objective today is to derive and analyze the optimum combining beam former for multiple receive <coughs> antennas. So I assume you guys started on discussing about the MIMO communication systems with multiple antennas or maybe not. A little bit? No? Okay. I'll, I'll touch the basics here. Uh, and second objective is to explain the challenges of extracting diversity <coughs> from multiple antennas. And, and, and as I'll get into it a little bit later, diversity refers to really the, the, the benefits uh, that comes with the, the use of multiple antennas in these uh, communication systems. And the third objective is to derive and analyze the optimum transmit beam forming Vector. So in using multiple transmit antennas in these communication systems, <clears throat> how do you optimize uh, the use of those multiple antennas? And we'll, we'll talk about several of those schemes, uh, in particular when you have multiple antennas at the receive side and when you have multiple transmit antennas at the transmit side. So to get this uh, started, the main system that we consider is, first of all, with multiple receive antennas. <coughs> so here, uh, the baseband uh, equivalent system that we consider is we have some transmit symbol S that we want to communicate to your receiver. And this is being transmitted from a single antenna. Okay. And this goes over a channel, and at the receiver side, you have some receiver block. And this guy has multiple receive antennas on it, okay? And let's say this is antenna number one through number NR receive antennas. So in total, there are NR receive antennas, okay? And then, given some receiver structure, out comes your uh, estimated receive symbol S hat. And here, uh, what, what happens is when you, when you think about the electromagnetic transmissions, uh, you, you have a wave, wave front that's coming out of this antenna. Uh, this guy gets propagated all over the place, right? And essentially, you will end up with multiple paths leading to the number of uh, received antennas. So for antenna number one, you might have a channel H1, uh, another channel to H2, and so forth, down to antenna number H and R, okay? And we look at this case where all of these channels can be considered to be a uh, ind independent uh, statistical process, and we, we refer to that to, uh, as flat fading channels. 
So you've seen uh, uh, similar concepts in single antenna uh, communication systems, and now we've extended to the case where this is a multiple received antennas. Okay? And we'll go and analyze uh, uh, what are the challenges and the, uh, the benefits of these systems are. Okay? So uh, if we analyze a system, Each uh, uh, receiver path, so receive path, so this is really per antenna. See, you can express this as, say, receive symbol Y1 with the usual uh, transmit symbol normalization E of X square root with the channel H1 that I just drew earlier with the transmit symbol S plus some noise component V1. On the second antenna, you similarly have the transmit symbol energy EX square root H2 S plus V2. And note that the, we're only transmitted through one antenna, so you really have one common transmit symbol S. And, and you really end up with multiple equations uh, given the same uh, transmit symbol S. And, and getting a multiple observation of that same uh, signal subject to different channels, okay? So you write this out all the way an out to antenna number NR. You end up with this series of uh, equations, S plus noise at NR, okay? And Again, this is under the assumption, the usual assumptions of after sampling, perfect synchronization, etc. Okay, so assuming you have a perfect system uh, in, 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 in digitizing and getting the baseband signal. So let, let's think about this a little bit, and uh, you know, given given what you know, how would you leverage all these different number of antennas? Are these uh, just redundant for you, or do you get new information out of this if you have multiple received antennas? Any guesses? Special diversity. Special diversity. That's right. So in in reality, what happens is uh, given, you know, if, you have, if I have multiple receive antennas here, right, these two antennas will receive signals from different directions, possibly different reflections. And, and each of those could have uh, different effects from the channel, giving you uh, potentially benefit to select either one or combine them in a, in a clever way. And, and the easiest way that I uh, like to think of, uh, Professor Heath may not uh, agree with me all the time, but uh, uh, your ears are really the same thing. So, you know, audio communication is very much the same thing. You're speaking from your one mouth, and you're listening with your two ears and finding where, you're, where the other voice is coming from. It's really the same principle, but happening in the ele electromagnetic realm, okay? So you might have different reflections coming from different areas, and, you know, whichever direction sounds the strongest, you might think that's where the signal is coming from. So, the, the early uh, implementation of this and, and the, the obvious uh, choice uh, to uh, leverage this uh, technique was called the antenna selection. And the principle is really simple. You simply pick an antenna with the best channel, okay? So if, if somebody was talking, you know, to the right of me, and I say, okay, I hear more from the right, let me shut off the left here so that I don't get any noise, you hear better with the guy from the right. And, and that's exactly the same principle, uh, except happening in the electromagnetics. So. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and analyze this. Uh, 
So when we look at the uh, case channel, uh, case antenna, we can write the signal to noise as H sub K, the usual signal to noise subject to the channel gain. Okay. Now, uh, given that we have multiple of these observations, so uh, here we're really analyzing individual uh, signals at each of the received antennas. Okay, so you end up with you know SNR H of one, SNR H of two, corresponding to each of the received antennas. Now the idea is we want to find the best one uh, that gives you the best reception. So the problem here is to choose the optimal K star such that K star is the argmax of K 1 through NR of this signal to noise expression for each of the HKs. Okay. So to uh, visualize this, the way to think of this is over time, uh, you might end up with some channel H1. So this is like the channel gain or magnitude that might fluctuate like this. And then, so this is magnitude of H1. Yeah. So this is H1 of T, to be precise. And then you might have another channel, H2. It's a good way to do this. Say, moving like this, H2 of T. So if you, if you look at it vertically, <coughs> This is really the time snapshot of SNR over t across time for each of those <coughs> received antennas. And, then, and this actually happens a lot, and it's actually a lot more severe in the real life. You would actually get very uh, deep uh, dips and, and potentially on the upside as well. And, and these are called uh, fading, as you might recall from your channel discussions. So you might see some deep fades in different places that'll make this boundaries very uh, complex looking. Now, <coughs> different color here. So the, the argmax uh, maximization problem here is to really, based on these observations, you want to select the antenna that corresponds to the better signal to noise ratio. So it'll be these ones on the top, if, if you had two received antennas. And, and given this scheme, the idea is that you end up with the best uh, signal to noise that's immediately available to your antenna uh, in this receiver systems. Okay. Now the difficulty, of course, is being able to track these uh, channels and being able to switch between these. Yeah, so you would switch the antennas, and hence the the name antenna selection. So if you if you saw a jump from uh, antenna one having a better signal to noise to antenna two. Are you referring to this? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was just referring to potentially just a peak that comes up in in, in this case, right? So you might have a fade as well as an up, up, uptick, so right? It, it depends. So, so the, the real life answer is it depends because in real life what you need to do is you need to do some finite time interval averaging to estimate this signal to noise ratio. You can get, try to get instantaneous one as well as some time average one. And in certain cases you might see this uh, fades, or you may not see that. 
So it's, it's system dependent, but typically um, for, for most relevant scales, you will see something like that. This is intended to be real time, yeah. So how would they know which batch is bad before they run all the tests? Yeah, so you would you would know. So you 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 assume there's some coherence time that that this channel holds for a certain amount of time. So when you ma when you make the observation, uh, you assume that this channel is good for the next few symbols, perhaps. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So it, it's not it's not exactly uh, real time, instantaneous in that sense. Yes, you, you're making some assumption about what how long that channel is valid for. Yeah. Okay, this makes sense so far, everyone. Okay. Okay, so let's look at a more, a little more sophisticated uh, technique, and this one is called the maximum oops, a fuzzy, maximum ratio combining or MRC. Okay, so we're going to introduce a little bit uh, more complicated uh, receiver structure here. Um, so the system looks like this. Uh, you still have multiple uh, receive antennas. And the idea here is we're going to weigh each of these antenna input with yet to be uh, determined scales uh, W1 of star for antenna one and all the way to antenna NR with W and R of star. And then linearly combine this to get your output, let's call it Z, which is going to be W1 star multiplied with say receive signal Y1, YNR, plus W2 star Y2, plus W all the way up to WNR star Y sub NR. And this is also referred to as receiver beam forming. Okay. So, so the idea here is uh, we're going to have some knowledge about the channel, and the idea is to weigh each of those so that you get some uh, optimal uh, receive signal quality. And then we can do this quite uh, intelligently, although at first sight, if you've never seen this before, it looks a bit magical that you can you know, weigh these and, and get a, a better receive signal, but, but indeed uh, you can. So let's let's work through this a little bit. Uh, first, some definitions. Uh, we're going to define W to be a vector of complex weights from W1 to WNR. And I believe Professor he's been using the star as a conjugate or conjugate transpose, right? Hermitian transpose. Okay. So W is your usual column vector. Y is your receive vector, so we're going to write this in the vector form, Y1 through YNR. And from the previous uh, expression, we can write this as E of X, H1S plus V1, and so forth. HNR, S plus V. NR, sorry. 
Okay. So uh, writing this in vector equation, we can say that z is really equal to w Hermitian transpose times y vector. It's not that shouldn't be too hard to see from here. It's just a inner product of w and y, right? We go ahead and expand this. U of x, h, vector s plus v, vector. And then multiply in the w's. U of x, w star, h bar, s plus w star, v bar. So when we try to analyze the uh, signal to noise of, of this system, um, just by looking at this, we find that this component gives the signal energy that's going to be weighted by W star, right? And the noise component is going to be uh, shaped by W in this case, right? So you end up with the uh, complex distribution of zero mean with variance and zero with some factors um, associated with the W, okay? So based on this, um, we can formulate uh, the calculation of the optimal W that'll give you the best signal to noise of this expression, okay? So we'll go ahead and work on that. Okay. So how to obtain best W vector? So let's write um, the optimal W as hog max again of, I'm going to put a substitute symbol Q vector in the, uh, as a complex NR dimensional vector to write a signal to noise expression E of X uh, Q star H h bar squared over the noise component and zero, again, weighted by q star q vector. Okay, so this is really straight out of the previous expression, except that I'm using a substitute variable q right, for the argmax expression. So I'll just note here that the uh, W star H square is really the inner product of W and H squared and W times W is just the inner product of W. Now, if you recall a, the relationship that with these inner products of two variables, you can upper bound this as inner product of one vector and the inner product of another vector. Okay, and, and these are equal if and only if, say, W is a scalar of the other vector. And this is the scalar. OK? 
So using this bound, uh, we can actually proceed to analyze this uh, argmax. So let's work through this. So this will be ex n0 w star h squared w star w. And this is going to be less than or equal to exn0. And we're going to write it using this form. It's going to be the inner product of w and h. These are all vectors over the inner product of w in the denominator. Okay, so these cancel out nicely. We can proceed with this expression <coughs> to say this is really ex n0 h sub h, which is really e of x n0 with the squared norm <coughs> of h. So we can say that e of x and 0 w star h squared over w star w is less than or equal to e x and 0 h norm squared. Now, uh, next step, what we'll do is we'll just say, we'll let w to be actually equal to h. And what this amount to is that w is really a uh, matched filter that you've learned in your digital comms uh, class. Okay. I'll just keep this up for you in case you're catching up. So with this, let's uh, look at the system again um, from your antenna number one. <clears throat> we're going to weigh this with H1 conjugate all the way down to HNR conjugate. And we're going to sum this up together. This is what we concluded from the previous derivation. <clears throat> and if we work through this expression, the z, we find that we get h star that correspond to these weight vectors times the, the actual channel that the signal went through, h s plus h star V. <clears throat> and we note that h star h is really just the inner product, and you get the norm squared. So you do some basic uh, expansion as sums of individual components. And writing, uh, writing h of n as some magnitude component with some phase, you end up with some n equal 1 to nr of an e to the minus j theta n 
a n e to the j theta n, which is a n squared. <coughs> so you really end up with just the magnitude square of the <coughs> channel vector alone. Might have missed some notes here. So actually, this is fine. <clears throat> so, so what what this really tells you is that <clears throat> for for each of the receiver antennas, you're really taking the the all the available energy in in that from that given that channel. So you know, suppose that the channel H has a range from zero to one, and 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 the input or the receive signal is scaled within that range, you're really squaring each of those energies, at each of the, those receive antennas, adding them all up so that you get the maximum um, information from that receive signal. Okay? And this actu actually turns out to be a very, uh, very practical and um, uh, useful technique. So I guess one way to visualize this is, is, you know, if you have a complex plane with the channel vector h, then you're really multiplying this with your conjugate h star to get your magnitude. And it's just really projecting onto the real and, and adding them all up. So that's that's really the uh, principle behind this. So let's uh, try and analyze how this system will perform. Okay. Hopefully, I can get through this. That next ten. So you have till ten fifteen. Is that right? Okay. So some analysis of maximum ratio combining. <coughs> Is it? Oh. Yeah, that's annoying, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so Let's suppose now uh, the channels H sub K with our usual assumption of complex uh, zero mean unit variance channels uh, <coughs> to make this analysis tractable. And also assume that uh, each of the HKs are independent process. So just a little statistics review. I'm sure he's uh, gone through this. Um, so with the uh, random variable x, uh, multivariate uh, complex distribution with mean m and uh, variance r, you would have expected value of x 
to be what, x minus the mean, x minus the mean star, and your uh, complex Gaussian distribution expression for this is f of x to be equal to 1 over pi to the n, if, it's, if this is n dimension, with uh, magnitude of correlation matrix R e to the minus x minus the mean conjugate inverse of the correlation or the variance x minus m bar. Okay. <coughs> and we also assume that the uh, the noise, oh the, oh no, sorry, uh, the h. So we can write h channel h to be the complex distribution with zero and the identity vector and a matrix component and the distribution function for this would be f of h 1 over pi to the nth power e to the minus h star h. So I'm giving you all the pieces needed for this derivation. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so let's try to work through this. This is really the uh, highlight of today's lecture, I think. Um, so we want to find, um, with this uh, maximum ratio combining scheme, what your <coughs> error probability looks like uh, given the system, given the, uh, the channel statistics that we assumed in, in, this, uh, in this note. So we go ahead and try to analyze the expected value of probability of error of this system given some SNR, as a function of SNR, given these channels. <coughs> right. So early in the class, uh, I hope uh, you had uh, this notion of um, union bound. You guys recall that? Which said that the PE of EX over N naught is M minus 1 for M quam system square root EX D min squared over 2 N naught. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and invoke this to uh, bound this expected value. So this is due to union bound. We can rewrite this to be expected value of m minus 1 q function of square root ex d mean squared 2 and not with the h factor in this expression. Okay, and you also sh uh, saw earlier, uh, hopefully the Chernoff bound early in the class, right? So let's just uh, remind ourselves, uh, Chernoff bound said a function qx is, can be bounded by exponential minus e to the 
minus x squared over 2. So we're going to invoke this. to write expected value of m minus 1 of e to the minus ex d mean squared. Now you have a factor, extra factor of 2, so this becomes 4 and not h star h bars. Okay. Now, using the previous uh, expressions for these uh, variables, distribution functions, we go ahead and write, the, uh, write out the expected value. So this is going to equal m minus 1 of multiple integrals of 1 over pi nr because uh, H has dimension nr, right? And for the H distribution, we get e to the minus h star h. And also for the, the signal component, we get e to the minus ex d mean squared for and not h star h, d h1, d d h2, and so on, to d of h and r. It's just a bit of a monster equation, but don't be afraid. Uh, we'll get through this, okay? So using this uh, correlation of the variance uh, matrix r, we can again rewrite this. Actually, brings a nice simplification to this expression, e to the pi, nr, and I'll put r over r, e h star h. Oh, I'm sorry. So we're going to combine this and, and, and ma make it into a matrix form. So it's going to be e to the minus h star identity plus ex d mean squared for and not times the identity of h and the h1 the h and r. So we break these inner product and put it into diagonal matrix, put, put the constants into diagonal matrix, and you end up with this form. So just for the sake of completeness, we say R is really equal to I plus EX D min squared for and not I inverse. where I is the identity, uh, sorry, identity. Uh, this is a NR by NR square matrix. Okay. Now, using the property that uh, f of x to pi 1 over pi e to the minus x squared gives you an integral f of x dx to be 1. <clears throat> this actually simplifies down to simply m minus 1 magnitude of matrix R. And plugging this uh, expression right back in, you really end up with uh, m minus 1 over, what is it, ex 
d min squared for n naught plus 1 to the nr power right so so I kind of skipped a step so if you if you consider this a diagonal matrix it's really just taking the sums across that uh, so I take individual ones and, and take it to the power of nr right so after uh, after all this uh, monster equation so we started with the expected value of probability of error of this maximum ratio combining system right you can bound it it's, it's not equal to it's bounded because we invoked union and turn of bounds by this expression and if you look at this um, we have the ex over n naught factor which is your signal to noise ratio of the system right so we make another uh, asymptotic uh, approximation that as, as the uh, for, for high SNR, so high SNR, uh, so EX over N0 going to infinity, as you increase this uh, factor, what you find that is that contribution of simple number one uh, becomes very small. So we uh, approximate this by upper bound this by N minus 1 EX d min squared for n naught n r, <coughs> which is a lot, lot more cleaner uh, expression. So a couple of things to note here is that this uh, probability of error function is uh, inversely proportional to this signal to noise ratio to the n r factor which is a uh, receive a number of receive antennas okay and also to the the minimum distance of the uh, system so what this amounts to is actually quite interesting because if we analyze the just to get a graphical interpretation of this if we write the probability of error as a function of SNR over SNR, and this is going to be in dB, dB scale and log scale on the y-axis. And we're going to look at this expression. What you'll find as a function of SNR is that uh, if you have one uh, receive antenna, your probability of error might look something like this with a slope of minus one. Okay. And as you increase the number of antennas with two antennas, you start to see increasing slope. And these are all remember that this is an asymptotic behavior. So as, as the SNR go high, that contribution of uh, one factor becomes small, so you end up with nearly straight line as you go higher. And as you go higher and higher with number of antennas, you end up with a slope of negative NR. Okay? So what does this mean from system design perspective? <coughs> At a, at a given at a given operating SNR with more antennas you're likely to have lower probability of error right than with with less number of antennas also for a given the error rate target that your system might have the more antenna you have it gives you this much uh, signal to noise margin to your system to operate in to achieve that particular bit error rate. So you can look at this in, in, in both of the axes. And, and this is what's referred to as the 
diversity order of this maximum ratio combining system. And we define it as negative limit of as SNR goes to infinity of probability of error as a function of SNR to the log of SNR, which is what we just uh, graphically described. So a couple of things uh, to note uh, that the diversity diversity improves this bit error rate performance and uh, reduces small scale. fade margin because you have more room to wiggle around, right? And given this, you can see that some diversity goes a long way. So yes, it's difficult to put multiple antennas on, on these radios, but you know, if you had those extra radios, you can do quite a bit uh, better than with a single antenna systems. Okay. So, just on the uh, practical note of things, um, recall that uh, recall that we made an assumption about independent channels, right? And, and how, how true is that in real life? Um, it turns out that you can achieve independent channels uh, fairly uh, reasonably. Uh, so to have the correlated channels, um, the first thing to look at is we need antenna spacing. Antennas to be spaced greater than the coherence distance. And this depends on the particular um, antenna implementation that you find. Uh, so for example, in the handset world, <clears throat> this could be uh, half a wavelength and sorry for my horrible writing sorry. hand set and the base station, you know the big towers that you see on the road. Typically we see about five lambda uh, spacing. I'll just put a note that there are a lot of factors that goes into these uh, antenna uh, placement design. So it can be it can be less. For example, with polarization or pattern diversity, which is another way of exploiting these multiple antennas. Okay. So I guess we're almost out of time. Uh, I thought it would be a good time for a quick intermission talk. Um, sorry, I'm half, half an hour late for that, but <laughs> I'm sure you've been waiting for that. Um, so how many of you know national instruments in this group? Most of you know? What, what do you know National Instrument as, as a company of what? VSRP. VSRP? <laughs> okay. What's that? Software? LabVIEW? You've seen LabVIEW maybe in your classes? Okay. But you might think uh, 
what does NI has to do with wireless at all, right? Um, so I, I, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a perspective on that. So, so I, I, I've been fortunate to be involved in all different layers of, of wireless activities yeah, uh, in the industry. Um, I actually moved to Austin to work for Motorola, and then I went on to uh, found my own company where we built prototype for uh, uh, cellular carriers. Uh, so we were actually building LTE prototypes back in two, 2004, 2005, so very early on. And then I, I came back to school to do my PhD with uh, Professor Heath and then went on to National Instruments. So there, um, actually, we are involved in very different levels of, of this wireless industry. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, you know or you might have seen in the past, so I'll just give you a quick sketch. So if you look all the way from uh, like the top governing bodies of these wireless industry, um, internationally there are groups called, there's a group called the ITU, International Telecom Union, which, which is really just a collection of individual countries governing bodies coming together and say, you know, how do we use this particular frequency spectrum, for example, and, and what kind of communication do we allow what do we reserve for the military and so forth? It, it's, I, I would say it's more political than technical, but um, nevertheless, it's a, it's a very interesting place. And a little bit further down the stream, you find groups like uh, 3GPP, which is really a consortium of various countries' uh, governing bodies and the industry from each of those countries represented in this group. So, so I, we, I used to represent NI at this uh, 3GPP meetings. And what, what we do is essentially uh, hop all over the world, go to different places to have these meetings. And we'll be stuck in a hotel meeting room, uh, maybe anywhere from 20 to 300 people in one room, everybody facing their laptop, and, and uh, with just one chairman, one or two chairmen up front. And we're all discussing uh, what modulation scheme, what coding scheme, what systems work, what, what are the next generation systems are like. And, and uh, it, in, a, in a sense, it sounds a little bit rosy to some, and, and there are some interesting, very technically interesting parts. The other side is you know, uh, coordinating with other companies, other uh, governing bodies. Sometimes we will have representatives from FCC telling everybody that, oh, you can't put a signal there because your spurious emission comes out to a particular FCC's band that <clears throat> they care about. Um, so recently, the, the, the ones during my uh, attendance in the meeting, we had some debate about uh, uh, the GPS signal uh, interfering with the LT, certain LT signals and LT corrupting some of those localization uh, signals. And there was a pretty, pretty long heated debate about that. So anyways, um, this is where a lot of the uh, standards like the GSM, LTE, LTE Advanced, what it's coming, and, and we're actually moving towards uh, more advanced uh, topics there. Uh, typically, these, these guys are four to five years uh, further down the line than what you see uh, from AT&T and Sprint and so forth. Uh, so. There are a number of companies and industries uh, supporting this. So you would find uh, carriers, right? So the AT&Ts, the Sprints, uh, uh, Verizon, and so forth. You find the base station manufacturers, right? So these are the guys that build the big towers that you see out there. Those are the obvious ones, but if you look carefully in some of the urban places, you'll find the little white boxes uh, sitting next to buildings. Those are uh, also base stations, and, and there are a number of them in town. So, and, and if you look carefully, you can actually see markings from Ericsson, uh, Alcatel, Lucent, and so forth. So uh, for some of you radio geeks, it's actually fun to go out and try to identify where each of those base stations come from. And of course, uh, the ones you see the most, um, you have the handset companies, right? 
and and there are some miscellaneous companies that are, are involved from different uh, particular industries where they might use it for seller standards for automations and various other applications. Now, if you look further into these, so you probably know a few companies in each of these buckets. Uh, you'll find a number of companies actually uh, supporting this that does uh, systems uh, integration. Uh, you got uh, PCB makers, right? You got chip manufacturers. Um, what else? You got application. Software, right? So if you look at the handset world, you, you know, Qualcomm is obviously the famous one that makes the chipset for these. LTE now makes, uh, not LTE, uh, Intel now makes the LTE chipset. There are a number of other players there who makes the baseband chipset. And then there are other system integrators that actually creates the board that eventually goes into your handset uh, uh, cell phones. So if you actually took, out, took apart some of your uh, cell phones, you'll actually find a number of companies involved in making those handsets come true. <clears throat> so um, where does this all lead to is, is that there's this huge uh, ecosystem uh, that's really supporting this wireless industry. And, and what you're learning in this class is not only applicable to people doing standards or perhaps uh, a company like Qualcomm making these chipsets, but actually all of these, you know, people putting together a base station, putting together a system together, uh, even the carriers, uh, really requires deep knowledge in, you know, techniques, MIMO techniques, signal processing techniques, and so forth, to actually analyze how their systems are performing in the real world. And, and a lot of uh, channel analysis goes into carriers because they want to guarantee 99.9% .9 certain probability of error in their, in their system. For example, uh, base station <clears throat> often gets that demand from the carriers to meet that specs. And the handset is kind of working with both the carriers and the base station uh, companies. And, and you might be surprised that the handset needs to qualify under very rigorous tests that the carriers put out. And in fact, one of the uh, test facilities here is here in town in Arboretum at AT&T's test facility where they take handsets and test it against their networks and make sure they qualify to use on their uh, network. So, <clears throat> And it turns out uh, National Instruments uh, supports uh, this industry in, in all of these fronts. We, we do everything from defining the next generation communication systems to uh, building out and testing these uh, carriers, base stations, uh, handsets. Uh, we do a lot of handsets, uh, you know, sending signals to it, make sure that they can receive. And uh, similar with the base stations, everything from RF to baseband. So um, what you see uh, from, from us in, in school is actually used throughout the industry. Um, not so much with the USRP, that's more of a special prototype platform, but people are using LabVIEW and PXI instruments to actually build up and test some of these instruments. So you are uh, touching some of the leading industry uh, equipment there, so just so you know. So I guess uh, any questions so far? No? You all good? Am I putting you asleep? No. Okay, so that's just my quick pep talk. <clears throat> so in the next five minutes, let me uh, quickly go through this. So we talked about talked about uh, use of multiple antennas in the receive side. Now we're going to switch to the transmit side and talk about the Transmit diversity. So here the assumption is we have number of transmit antennas, each of which is going to present some channel H1 through HNR 
into a single <coughs> receive antenna. Okay. So, um, unlike the receive side, uh, the one thing to consider is with these multiple antennas, what do we transmit from each of these antennas? <coughs> so, the naive approach is to send the same signal from from all antennas. Okay? <clears throat> so we're going to assume uh, the transmit signal to be expressed as follows. So the usual uh, square root of e of x and uh, transmit symbol s. Now this is going to be scaled to square root of nt to to keep the sum power constant. <clears throat> and this is really just a, just a convention. It's, it's not the must to do, um, but it makes it easier uh, when you analyze and you know, aggregate all of the antennas. You, you get the square, uh, NT factor out to get a unit energy transmission. Uh, then working through this, uh, we're sending this from each of the antennas, subject to different antenna, uh, different channels. So we have h of one, square root of e of x, square root of n t, s, plus h two, square root of e of x, square root of n t, s, plus dot dot dot, all the way uh, out to h of n r, square root of e of x, square root of n t, s, plus some noise compact. And it's an easy exercise to rewrite this as square root of ex, 1 over square root of nt, sum of n equal 1 to nt h sub n s plus the noise v. And now suppose <coughs> the channels are again uh, zero mean, <coughs> zero mean unit <coughs> variance and uh, independent. Then it's not hard to see that the square root of n t sum a sub n is also complex distributed Gaussian distributed zero mean unit variance. So we can rewrite this as a simple uh, single uh, random variable where you end up with square root of e of x, say g s plus v, where g is this zero mean unit variance vector. Oops, sorry, like that. <coughs> so this is g. Okay, and the uh, quick conclusion is that this looks like a single antenna system with the signal with that Gaussian distribution. So re really the conclusion here is that there is no diversity benefit with this system. So <clears throat> the conclusion is that we must do something a little more clever than simply sending uh, the same signal out from these antennas. So I, I guess I'm out of time. So I think uh, Professor Heath will hopefully continue with the next topic of uh, maximum ratio transmission, where we actually leverage the channel information to intelligently form your transmit signal to get some diversity from this maximum ratio transmission system. And it, and it gets really uh, interesting from there on the feedback topic. So. That's uh, all I had. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to stick around for five, ten minutes and, and answer your questions. But otherwise, uh, thanks. Hope that made sense for you.